Well, it's a fairly complex story, or rather, on the surface, it's a very normal sort of story. A couple go and visit another couple for a weekend, and they do seemingly mundane things, like they play golf, they play tennis, they go to the beach. But actually, that's not the real story. The real story is tension and passion and jealousy and envy. I think it's also about how people can hide uh, inside themselves and present something quite different to the world from how their insides are really sort of functioning in terms of their mental processes. So uh, it's about deception, uh, about self-deception and about the power of lies and the destructive power of self-deception. We're very lucky that we have a, a novel, a best-selling novel that this came from, and uh, Sally Woodward Gentle at Carnival developed the novel. It's a Blake Morris novel. No, Blake is a poet and a novelist, and then that fantastic novel was turned into an equally superb uh, screenplay by Mick Ford. Blake Morrison said to me that he was surprised, and he may have been lying, but he said uh, he was surprised how much of the book had, had, had survived in, in the script. So if that's true, that was great. The role of Ian is taken by Sean Evans, um, and I think what Sean brings to this role is a sort of a, a quite exciting kind of nervous energy. Ollie and Daisy, they're my oldest friends. We met at college. Well, Ollie's my oldest friend because we were housemates, but Daisy came along soon after. And... Does anyone else have a problem with long-term friends, or is it just me? There's lots of... Um things going on inside of Ian's mind that he hides from the, from the other characters and uh, perhaps sometimes shares with us in sort of more private moments. I play a character called Ian Gold who is, um, who sort of narrates the story as it's going along and is a teacher, a primary school teacher it turns out and gets invited along on, an, um, on a weekend, a bank holiday weekend with his, uh, his best friend from college, a guy called Ollie. I was thinking, mm -hmm. I wonder if they're going to give us uniforms. You know, butler and housemaid. Oh, hey, hey listen, <laughs> I am not, not being waitress again for the weekend. I'm only no, joking. I'm not. I'm not. I'm serious. If we turn up and they've got friends there, then we just we make our excuses and we we hot put it out of there. So we're the only ones going. I know we are. As it progresses, you see that he's got a lot of beef with Ollie that is unresolved, um, and a lot of um, unresolved stuff with his wife and with Ollie's wife as well. Um, she's a social worker who gets quite involved, I think, with her various projects. She's kind of a bit heart on sleeve. The relationship with Ian, in Em's eyes, is good. She manages him well, and she's so down to earth, and she's positive that she kind of um, overlooks his little idiosyncrasies. I think it, um, Sean manages to capture this, the duality of this man who is on the surface quite charming and, and quite quick-witted and, and quite amusing, and at the same time manages to convey uh, in more sort of private moments this sort of undercurrent of, of uh, well, really quite a dangerous human being. When Ian and Em are driving down or up to Suffolk to the house that they're going to visit their friends in, they're imagining a fantastic country house with pool, tennis court, excitement. In fact, they come to a rather sinister and strange house. Oh, my. What a tip. Not what I expected. Oh. At last! About time! Where have you been? <laughs> no, you got lost or something. Sorry, you broke down trying uh, to call. No reception. Oh. Ian and Ollie's relationship is strange. I mean, they were friends at university and they've sort of stayed friends through the last 20 years, but I don't think they are very alike. I, don't, I mean, they're, they're competitive, they're like competing against each other, they have a competition which they return to every time they meet up. Have you brought your clubs, right? Yeah, sure. Oh, and there's no jeans, no cords, no shorts. You got some chinos or something? Oh, I didn't. Of course oh, he oh. didn't. What? I think he values Ian as a friend, but um, I don't think they're best mates, they don't sort of... They're not sort of soul soulmates, really. They they kind of need each other for different reasons other than just friendship. Ollie 
has, since university, risen to the heights of being a barrister, an aspiring QC. Meanwhile, Ian is a primary school teacher, and, and we see from the off that they live in very different worlds. They inhabit very different territories. Ollie was good-looking, well-dressed, very confident, sporty, and let's face it, rich. The vital ingredient, especially with the ladies. He's kind of like the golden boy. I mean, he's got it all, but now has just been diagnosed with uh, a brain tumour, so it feels like he's about to lose everything. I've got an inoperable brain tumour. I'm going to die. As in soon, as in, you know, I'm still around in six months, it'll be a miracle. I think Rupert's brilliant. Um, and we've, I'd, uh, we've worked together three times this year, um, which I think is funny. Like, it's always funny the way things work out. And now we're playing uh, two best friends who've got this, this sort of history. We just seem to instinctively know how to react to the other person's performance. And when you have that with another actor, it's rare and a great relief. It's brilliant for that, you know, rather than meeting somebody brand new and um, having to make up all of that kind of uh, backstory in a way. It's kind of, it's there for us because there's already a familiarity and each of us knows how the other kind of works and it's, so it creates something new, you know, um, which is good and I'm really grateful for. And Rupert brings a uh, sort of natural sense of authority to the role of Ollie, who is a, a barrister, uh, you know, a man of great um, intellectual power, uh, a man who is a, has an aggressive kind of killer instinct. Roles that uh, Rupert has done in the past have prepared him exceedingly well for a high-powered, competitive individual. Wait, no, no, that's mine. I'm playing Archie, um, who is Ollie's son. Um, and he's, um, he's a bit of a rebel. I think he's, uh, well, he's dropped out of school. Um, and he, I think he, he doesn't really like uh, being told what to do, especially by his dad. He succeeded in everything he set his mind to. And the fact that he's not succeeding as a father in terms of his son succeeding himself is irritating to him. His, his whole thing with Ian is that he's basically competing or that he's showing Ian how much better at everything uh, Ollie is. But when it comes to his son, he really can't use his son as one of those things that's, uh, that, that, that's better about him. I'm not gonna say that you've grown, but you have, and... Oh, that's good to see you, how's things? How's school? Which way have you gone? Uh, uh, arts or can science? I just say the restaurant we're going to is fairly smart, so if you guys want to get ready, we need to be leaving in about half an hour. Shall we, uh, shall we make a move? Sure, yeah. Are you coming along? Uh, no, uh, it's a fish restaurant. Archie hates fish. You hate it, don't you? It's pointless, he hates fish. It's OK, me and the dog will look after each other. Archie, can you uh, come and give me a hand? It's good to see you. Yeah. You can come if you want. I don't want to. Daisy has a history with both Ian and Ollie because she was at university with them both. Um, she was uh, a friend, a very close friend of Ian's before she started going out with Ollie as a student. So she has an individual and a combined history with both men. Kissing Daisy was amazing. Like she was pure before Ollie and Daisy got together. Ian was dating Daisy and was smitten, completely in love with her. Um, but you're not given that information at the very beginning. It's something that's bled slowly into the story. And in many ways, Daisy is kind of the love of his life and he always holds a torch for her. Daisy is an interesting figure in so much as we have to... Um, uh, uh, sort of, we have to fall in love with her and uh, we have to be charmed by her. More importantly, we have to see how those charms work upon the male characters around her. Oh my God, do you know who that is? It's Milo, Milo! Hi, it's Milo, It's Milo, one of Daisy's clients. I think I told Ian that he might be coming. Oh, okay. It's, it's a... Milo's uh, a friend of, of Daisy's who's, who is the, uh, the wife of of Ollie, the couple who've invited us all for, for the weekend. And I'm a business associate of hers, and I kind of come out to the, uh, to the house uh, and, and kind of get in the way. He's like a grain of sand in the oyster. Um, uh, Ian, who is full of jealousy and full of envy and full of spite and secretly wants to get Daisy back, is very distressed to find out that um, uh, suddenly, unbeknownst to him, another man has been invited, Milo, who Daisy, the love of his life, 
seems to adore, and uh, this puts Ian's nose right out of joint. Really, Milo is just a nice guy. He gets put in a situation where people seem to hate him. The novel of The Last Weekend is set on the Suffolk coast. There's a big old country house which is rented for the long August bank holiday weekend by the character of Ollie. We've had a bit of an excursion to the beach where we could actually, when we did go to Suffolk and we filmed on some of the actual beaches that Blake Morrison, the novelist, described in, in the original novel. Um, but what we've done is we've, we've brought the house back to uh, Guildford and we found this rather strange, dilapidated ex-priory, 1920s priory, to represent the farmhouse uh, that's in Suffolk. It's very odd. It's the first house we looked at and it just felt it had been sitting here waiting for this production. Because there's the novel, our, our very talented production designer, David Roger, has been able to read the book, see the detail, and then go out and look to recreate that detail. The strange objects that are uh, slightly disquieting, but, but also normal. You can try to compare it to Miss Havisham's house in Great Expectations, it seems full of ghosts. This is a, is a kind of modern version of that, actually, where the house is a metaphor for a man's diseased mind, if you like. The challenging thing about The Last Weekend is that the novel it has an unreliable narrator, that is. It's an eye telling you a story through it. And gradually, we discover that we can't trust this person. No, 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 no. Oh, oh. 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 I'm not saying there wasn't some resistance and guilt on her part, on both our parts. But that bite to my shoulder while the nails raked my back when I was to excite, not deter. I hope that people, if they enjoy this, will go to the book and enjoy all that that has to offer as well, because there's the stuff in the book which I simply didn't have time to put in. I had to condense a lot of stuff and put them in new sequences to make, to make it work. The process for me of finding a director and working with the director is, is always the same. You send out scripts, you meet a group of people, and you listen to what they have to say, and you listen to their, you feel their enthusiasm. And uh, John East came in, and he was hungry for this. He's so committed to telling the story in, in a very specific way, and on top of the work, that he's kind of, it's a, it's a joy. He's so enthusiastic, he's like a kid. He's like a six-year-old child in a toy store. He's so he has so much energy so much enthusiasm he sets up scenes and kind of runs through what are you gonna do um, he could probably actually act the whole thing himself play all the characters quite competently if you meet John he's he's gonna have a list of questions which uh, are always very particular and show how you know that he knows exactly what he's doing and if you don't then it will expose that and you have to go and do a bit more work on it. I have to say, I've really enjoyed making this uh, piece so far. We're only halfway through the filming, but it's uh, has been very, very rewarding. I think the energy and enthusiasm will communicate itself, hopefully, to the audience, and they will pick up on that and enjoy the piece too. Our commissioning editors and our executives from the start have, have been taking a risk with this and saying, it's, it's, it's a thriller with a difference. It's a psychological thriller. It's a thriller that examines the human condition, pushes humanity to extremes. To my mind, that makes for a very, very interesting drama.